So welcome to Fair Housing Fridays, take two. Uh, I'm Jess Hyman from the Fair Housing Project at CBOEO, and I'm here today with Corinne Yance, also from the Fair Housing Project, and Erhard Monke from the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Now, we started this new, uh, this new series of Friday webinars last week, and we had a little technical snafu. We had been trying to record it, and it didn't work. And we had a great conversation with about 30 people on the call, a mixture of housing providers, community members, advocates, and others, uh, with great conversation, great questions. We had presentations by Earhart and also by Chris, Mo uh, by Chris Donnelly from the Champlain Housing Trust. And we're not going to be able to recreate the entire webinar here today, but we wanted to share some of the important points. And we also have from Champlain Housing Trust and other resources to share as well. Um, so these, this series of, of Fair Housing Fridays is part, or part of, the series is part of Fair Housing Month, which celebrates the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. And if you look at the text connected to this video, you'll get some great information and information about fair housing. And we would like to start with, Air, with Earhart. And the topic for this Fair Housing Friday is, oh my gosh, Corinne, I've forgotten the name, the, the topic of our, of our Fair Housing Friday. It is? State and federal policy, uh, housing policy during the COVID-19 crisis. I think we had it more succinct than that, but the right. theme. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. So. Earhart, can you tell us what's happening at the state level in response to COVID-19 and how it affects housing? Uh, sure, Jess, uh, and thanks for having me. And uh, also the interview we did with, uh, with Chris last, last week, it's really too bad that the technology didn't, didn't quite work out. But uh, yeah, so um, our little bit of big picture background first, our legislature uh, basically uh, kind of went home uh, on Friday, March 13th, um, it was a Friday the 13th, uh, just about exactly a month ago. And it took them a little while, but they uh, figured out how to meet remotely. And so committees, um, first from the Senate, and then uh, a little later on from the House, figured out how to meet remotely. They each have a YouTube channel, and uh, any of our viewers who's, who are interested in checking in with um, what's going on, with lawmakers uh, while they're not in Montpelier um, can go on the legislature's website, um, and uh, which is uh, legislature.vermont.gov. Uh, and uh, there's um, YouTube channels for each of those committees and you can check in uh, on the legislative schedules. Um, uh, you know, whichever committee is of interest to you, um, housing uh, is covered on the Senate side by Senate Economic Development uh, and on the House side by House uh, General Housing and Military Affairs. Um, so that's just a little bit of background, and uh, the Senate's actually met a couple times remotely uh, and has actually voted on bills. Um, the House is not quite there yet, but um, we're hoping that they're going to be there next week. So I just thought maybe a little stage setting there so uh, our viewers can um, kind of get a, a picture of, you know, they're doing Zoom conversations just like we're doing right now. Um, that's basically what they've been doing from their living rooms or their uh, their basements or, or, or their attics or, or wherever. Um, and, uh, and so they are busy trying in many, many different ways to uh, formulate a state response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, in terms of housing, um, the probably most important um, response has been that uh, Senate Economic Development and House General uh, have been both been working on a bill that uh, became S-333, uh, S stands for Senate, um, which institutes a statewide uh, eviction and mortgage foreclosure moratorium. Um, and before I go into that, I should also hasten to say uh, that the state's Public Utilities Commission uh, also instituted a moratorium on all electric shutoffs from all electric utilities in the state of Vermont. Um, and both, you know, both the House and the Senate committees um, uh, and uh, the Public Utilities Commission, I think, recognized early on 
that in a situation where people need to stay uh, safe by staying home uh, and not getting themselves infected or not, you know, if they um, happen to contract the virus, um, not uh, infect uh, other people that might be in a, uh, especially in a higher risk category, like people over 60 or, or with underlying healthcare issues. Um, if, if you're to stay safe at home, um, it's hard to do that if you're getting evicted. Uh, it's hard to do that if your electricity gets shut off. Um, and uh, also another um, thing that um, the legislature did, which I can talk about a little bit further on, is they passed, um, um, actually both um, chambers already passed a bill and the governor signed it H681, which among other things also orders uh, all municipalities um, to enact a moratorium on water and sewer shutoffs. So, uh, you know, obviously if you don't have water uh, and you can't wash your hands frequently, um, you can't be at home and stay safe at home. So um, those were, you know, the, the whole public health emergency really has informed uh, these, these responses um, that, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to have a home to, uh, to stay safe in. Um, and um, you, you have to have all those amenities and you uh, can't, can't, uh, can't get evicted. So I'll stop there. I can go, go more into detail on those, um, you know, as, as we go on in the, in the interview. Uh, Earhart, oh, sorry, Jess. <laughs> Still learning. <laughs> Earhart, you talked a little bit about the CARES Act, I believe, in our conversation last Friday. I was wondering if you can expand on how the CARES Act um, impacts housing in Vermont. Sure. So um, uh, while, um, great question, while the uh, state um, legislature, and of course, I, I didn't mention, you know, the executive branch, the Scott administration has been working incredibly hard and over time uh, on, on the response. Um, and that is probably, I would say, the primary response in terms of a state response so, so far. Um, and, you know, we could talk a little bit more about that. And I, I know uh, the materials Chris uh, gave you um, also describe uh, that a little bit in terms of how Champlain Housing Trust is interfacing with the with the state on that. But um, in terms of the federal response, so the federal response has been um, there have been three bills that uh, Congress has passed and that the president uh, has signed uh, addressing the COVID nineteen emergency. I'm going to focus on the third of the three, which is known as the CARES Act, um, and the CARES Act is a two trillion dollar. Um, relief bill. Uh, it's the largest ever. Uh, it's larger the, by a long shot than what was done in the 2008-2009 um, during the Great Recession to address um, the economic uh, downturn then, uh, by, by bigger by a long shot. And of course, this economic crisis seems to be deeper than the one that we experienced in uh, in 08 uh, 09 because uh, everything has just come to a grinding halt um, the cares act um, in that two trillion dollars there's sort of three categories of funding um, one is the uh, coronavirus relief fund which is a very uh, broad um, 1.25 um, well 1.25 billion is what the state of Vermont is going to receive. It's a, a, a 150 billion uh, dollar fund uh, nationwide, and uh, thanks to Senator Leahy, we have uh, what's known as a small state minimum, which means that no state, um, regardless of how small, will receive less than a certain amount. Um, and for Vermont, that's 1.25 billion um, dollars, which is a large amount um, for the state. Um, and, and it needs to be shared with municipal government, um, and it cannot be used to kind of backfill uh, all the lost uh, income to the state, the lost taxes, the lost tax revenues. Um, it has to be used specifically uh, to address the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so the next um, large, uh, the next large tranche of, of funds is categorical funds, um, which are funds that have a very specific uh, kind of uh, kind of designation, uh, and I'll, I'll go to the talk about those in, in a little more detail in a moment. And the third uh, category is assistance to individuals, and in that um, you have, for instance, the twelve hundred dollars that uh, I think most folks have heard about that every individual uh, up to a certain income level is supposed to receive as a, a special one-time payment. Uh, for uh, couples, it's uh, 
$2,400 and uh, $500 per uh, dependent child uh, on top of that. And then of course, the um, unemployment insurance uh, benefits and uh, the major expansion of unemployment insurance benefits um, is in that uh, category, that individual assistance category. Um, for categorical, which is what we're uh, kind of dealing with in the housing world, is a major, um, about $12 billion, I think is the, the overall na nationwide number, um, has been allocated to uh, HUD, uh, the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is one of the major ways of funding uh, housing and homelessness um, throughout the, the country. And there's about seven or eight different subcategories in the HUD funding, everything from uh, rental assistance to people with Section 8, uh, Section 8 vouchers, a large increase for that. Um, there's a large increase for um, uh, project-based vouchers, which are uh, rental assistance vouchers attached to specific uh, units of, uh, of affordable housing. Um, there's community development block grant funds, which is a very broad, flexible uh, source of block grant funding uh, for the state and uh, city of Burlington gets its own. Uh, amount and then uh, also emergency solutions grants, which are geared uh, much more closely to um, dealing with the uh, crisis for uh, our homeless population. I'll stop there. See, um, you know, we can get into further details as 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 you like. Um, but um, yeah, that's that's sort of the the, the big picture uh, overview. Um, there's certainly other things I could talk about in the CARES Act, uh, like small business administration funding. Um, there's also uh, in that an eviction and foreclosure uh, moratorium uh, for all HUD on uh, HUD funded properties and uh, properties funded by uh, the United States uh, Department of Agriculture's Rural Development Program, um, and uh, also by uh, a foreclosure moratorium on mortgages that are backed by uh, the United States government um, through. Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac uh, or um, the Federal uh, Housing Administration, Veterans Administration, and, and, and so forth. Um, but the, that's sort of, you know, the, the big picture in terms of uh, housing funding. Of course, there's a lot of human services funding as well uh, for low-income uh, heating and, and cooling uh, through the LIHEAP uh, program. There's additional funding for our uh, anti-poverty agencies, the five community action agencies through something called community services block grants, um, and then also a major boost for childcare funding as well. Great, Th thank you, thank you very much. That was a really good, really good overview. Um, so coming back to the eviction mor moratorium in Vermont, can you share a little bit about what that means for renters and also for property owners and landlords? Sure. So. Um, it's it's actually um, there's a little uh, more background than just uh, the legislative uh, action. Uh, sort of first, what happened was the uh, Vermont Supreme Court issued an administrative order, uh, administrative order number 49, um, which basically um, said that uh, all judicial proceedings, all court proceedings, uh, were to be done on an emergency basis, um, and so. Uh, <clears throat> What that meant for evictions is that uh, any eviction that was not deemed to be an emergency at the discretion of a superior court judge uh, was on hold. Um, however, that didn't really take care of all evictions because there are things called writs of possession, which is when the sheriff, um, you've already got an eviction order and the sheriff comes to your door and uh, says, you have, you know, five business days. Um, I can't remember the exact number of days. It might be 10. I can't remember. Um, um, to, to leave. Um, and if you don't leave by that time, the sheriff comes back and makes sure you leave on the appointed date. Uh, so writs of possession were still being uh, issued and executed because um, they were not subject to um, the Supreme Court order. Uh, and then in addition, uh, five superior uh, five superior court judges in, in five different counties issued their own orders on writs of uh, possession, but they were writs of possession going forward. And so writs of possession that had previously been ordered were still being carried out. So um, it, it, the legislative moratorium that's wending its way through the process um, is not as broad as one might have thought <clears throat> originally. Um, and it does still leave the discretion of individual uh, superior court judges uh, in cases of emergency. Uh, for instance, if uh, you have uh, major criminal activity, uh, if you have uh, you know illegal drug activity, for instance, uh, uh, you know someone's cooking meth. There's a meth lab, um, uh, or or if there are acts of violence, um, or you know that, that threaten other uh, other. Um, 
other residents, then those are still things that can be taken up for uh, eviction. But eviction uh, due to non-payment of rent, um, presumably as the result of um, uh, you know, someone's loss of income, uh, loss of work hours, uh, loss of job uh, as a result of the pandemic um, is, is off the table uh, as are, uh, as are writs, uh, writs of possession. Um, what that means is, well, what it doesn't mean is that it's not a rent holiday. It doesn't mean you can simply stop paying your rent. If you have the money, if you have the wherewithal, if you're still working, you still have income, you're still receiving um, you know, your uh, benefits, um, um, you, you should be paying the rent, uh, especially because you know, if this lasts, and we don't know how long it's gonna last, it's last for several months, and you're not paying rent, that's gonna accumulate, and then there could be you know, massive number of potential evictions uh, at the back end of this, uh, when um, the emergency plus the 30 day, um, on some instances, 60 day grace period afterwards uh, uh, expires. Uh, it also doesn't mean that uh, a landlord can't file for an eviction. It's just, you can, you can go ahead and file for an eviction and you have to do that through the court system, uh, not by serving an individual, uh, but all of those, and any motion in court to uh, begin an eviction is stayed until, uh, after, uh, until 30 days after the emergency is over. Um, so, gotta keep paying your rent if if you have the wherewithal. But if you don't, um, your your landlord can't evict you right now. Uh, and of course, that brings up the other issue, which is <laughs> who's going to pay for all that at the end? Um, because landlords, especially in a state like Vermont, where we have just tons of mom and pop landlords, and full disclosure, um, we have a rental unit ourselves. So, uh, you know, you got to pay the bills. Um, uh, even if the town, you know, postpones property tax payments the way uh, Burlington uh, is, or you know, uh, is is more lenient about abatements, um, you still have other bills that you got to pay: uh, maintenance bills, uh, uh, you know, water and sewer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, we don't we want to make sure that landlords themselves are the property owners that are that are you know making housing available that they. Uh, don't wind up in foreclosure themselves. So um, the other companion issue, and this has not been made clear just yet, um, is how um, you know, will the state, will the federal government have a fund um, that helps to pay for um, people's rent when they are unable to pay it due to a loss of income from COVID-19? Um, where you know, a lot of people are hoping and expecting that the increase, the uh, much more generous uh, uh, unemployment insurance benefits are going to help with that. Uh, Six hundred dollars uh, from the federal government on top of the um, the state's um, weekly benefits, which you know Vermont's are better than some other states. Um, that that should put a lot of folks in a position to be able to continue paying the rent. But we know that there are going to be gaps. Um, and we also know that there's a lot of folks who don't get rental assistance that are living on fixed incomes that are stretched as it is paying over 50 and 60% of their income for their, their shelter costs. So um, how, how is this all going to be fixed? Well, the CARES Act uh, will take care of anyone on a rent subsidy, uh, whether it's a Section 8 tenant-based or project-based. Um, if they experience a loss of income, they can get their, uh, their subsidy adjusted and they should notify their property owner, whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit landlord, uh, and their housing authority just as absolutely soon as, as possible so that they can um, get an interim, uh, what's known as an interim recertification, uh, and they can get their subsidy adjusted to make up for their loss of income. Um, Unfortunately, there is still a number, quite a few. We haven't figured out exactly how many thousands uh, of units, but there are uh, probably several thousand units around the state that don't have, that are nonprofit affordable housing um, developments that don't have those kinds of rent subsidies in them and um, will so far do not have a federal source uh, to, uh, for their tenants to be made whole. Um, so one of the things that we propose to the state is uh, and to the legislature is that they create a state rental uh, housing relief fund um, for renters uh, to get additional rental assistance to fill any of the gaps that are left by the federal government um, and also, um, you know, to pay for arrears. Uh, so it could either come, you know, upfront through rental assistance like a Section 8 voucher or after the fact um, as a back rent sort of pay, uh, uh, payment um, to um, help make, uh, you know, bring the rent up, uh, up, to, up to speed. But that's yet to be determined. Um, and the Senate Economic Development Committee of uh, 
of the Senate, the Vermont Senate, is uh, they just started taking testimony late last week on uh, you know, what the state needs are, where the holes, well, first of all, they're trying to understand what the CARES Act does, because it's massive and it's hard to get your hands on, uh, wrap your, your hands around. Uh, so they're still trying to understand that and then trying to figure out where the gaps are. Yeah, so Erhard, um, that was a question that came up uh, more than once in our webinar, that concern around rent forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to clarify, when you, when you said um, earlier, there's been a proposal for a state rent forgiveness program, is that for nonprofit, like housing nonprofits or for... Sure. It would be across the board. Um, it would be across the board and, and how, um, you know, again, we have to really parse through the CARES Act um, and there's, there's a per potential for a second CARES Act or a, what would then be a fourth uh, federal relief slash stimulus bill um, that could come uh, later this month or, or in May. Um, so all that has to be taken into account because, you know, the state's financial situation is, is really dire. Um, the state is losing, you know, tens of millions of dollars worth of revenue as a result of the economic uh, crisis. So uh, obviously in first order, if there's a federal government solution, um, we want to look to that first. Um, but yeah, um, we're advocating for the state um, to set up, um, to either take some of the coronavirus relief funds, that $1.25 billion that is really pretty, uh, pretty unrestricted um, and that is supposed to help address uh, a whole lot of, um, of, of repercussions of, of, the, um, of the pandemic and the economic crisis that's, that's ensued. Um, we're advocating that either, whether it be taken from there or if it be stood up from uh, the state general fund, um, but there needs to be a, a broad-based kind of rental assistance relief fund <clears throat> ultimately to fill whatever gaps are left by the by the federal government and that could come through the tenants as rental assistance um, it would probably be administered by you know either a housing authority or by local anti-poverty agencies like CVOEO um, and then provided as direct assistance to tenants we do know that there is one source um, from what we've already been granted, which is those aforementioned CBG or um, that uh, they uh, allow for up to three months of um, income assistance to people who've experienced a loss of income, to, uh, and that could be designated as, as rental, uh, rental assistance or rental arrearage. And so we know that that's available for up to three months. Um, and it would be across the board. I, I, I'm sorry, what I meant to say also was, you know, this whole um, uh, kind of grand agreement around uh, a moratorium, an eviction moratorium um, by, by um, um, the legislature came as a result of very close work by Vermont Legal Aid, uh, working with the State Landlords Association, the Vermont Apartment Owners Association, as well as um, one of the um, one of the lawyers that works for uh, a number of our larger nonprofit housing providers. Uh, and they work through a just incredible minutia of language around landlord tenant law uh, and what happens you know, under certain circumstances uh, during the, uh, the COVID-19 emergency. And um, uh, part of you know, the backdrop, background to that, and one of the reasons that uh, I think um, other than this is a public health emergency and, you know, we're all in this together. Um, but other than that, um, you know, one of the reasons that I, I think made the landlord, uh, private sector landlord interests um, as willing to work on this is, you know, the, the understanding that there is going to be a fund that's going to help um, them pay the bills, um, whether it's directly through rental assistance or through some form of assistance to, uh, to small time landlords that are experiencing financial difficulties. So my follow-up question to that for uh, renters who really want to advocate for rent forgiveness, is there um, like, like what avenues would they go through? Who, like who should they be talking to to let their voices be heard on that issue? Well, I would say um, first off, um, they should call the governor's office <clears throat> and um, let the governor know that, um, you know, they've, lost income as a result of the pandemic and they can't pay the rent and they need the state to help 
fill whatever gaps are left by the federal government and the assistance that we're, we're getting from, uh, from the feds. Uh, so they should call the governor's office. They can also, uh, we know that landlords have been calling um, Housing Commissioner Josh Hanford um, to let Josh know that they're experiencing difficulties. I think uh, tenants can um, contact the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, as well. But I think in first order, um, the phone number that everybody can look up and quite easily is, is the governor's uh, office. I don't have it right in front of me, but y y you guys can provide it as uh, you know, one of the, the follow-ups. Um, and then the other thing is, is to go online on the legislature's website and find um, the chairs and the committee members of the Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs Committee uh, and the House, um, uh, the House uh, Ho General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Um, all of the members' emails are listed uh, on the website. Our, our legislature is incredibly transparent that way. Write them an email, shoot them an email. Um, or if you don't have access electronically, um, you know, uh, give them a call. Um, their, all, their contact information is, is there. Uh, they're all home now. They're all, uh, um, you know, safe, staying safe, staying home. Um, except for, you know, when they've got to go out for all the same things that we all have to go out for, getting groceries, et cetera. Um, so they're, they're all in that same situation. Um, and, uh, they're very responsive. Uh, they've, you know, from the committee meetings that I've been listening in on, uh, they're getting lots of calls and lots of uh, uh, emails from their constituencies. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll also um, say um, um, the uh, President Pro Tem of the Senate, Tim Ash, has a daily uh, briefing at 5.30 every day on Facebook, uh, on Facebook Live, and you can check in with, uh, with Tim. And, you know, as mentioned before, you can also check in on any of the YouTube channels and listen in on, on uh, and this is an amazing uh, era of governmental transparency in terms of the legislature, because uh, you don't have to be in Montpelier and sitting in a committee room to, to listen. You can, you can just dial in on YouTube. It's, it's pretty amazing. But yeah, direct advocacy is best. And, and, and of course, you know, people can give their stories to you all, uh, to me, uh, to Chris, you know, folks that, um, uh, you know, that, that do email um, on a more frequent basis and, and are in touch with lawmakers, because uh, we're certainly conduits for people's stories. Great. Th thank you. Um, yeah, I think we're really lucky here in Vermont, first of all, to have such a transparent government, but then this crisis is just allowing for more civic engagement and different ways for people to get engaged. And I think these things are going to stick too. I think we're going to, it's going to be easier for, for folks to have a voice in all of, in, in, in all of government now too. Um, so what are some of the other things that came up on Friday's webinar? Um, what questions from the audience or, th or things that you want to make sure that, that our second viewing audience uh, gets to hear? <laughs> One, one thing that I, I remember, um, uh, two things that I remember people asking. One was uh, someone asked about the uh, six, um, the um, uh, the twelve hundred dollar payment, um, you know, that every individual gets, uh, and what you know, if you're on, um, if you're on. Uh, uh, like Section 8, for instance, if you have a tenant base, is that going to get counted against you? And my understanding, uh, and we're still, you know, we're still um, reading every day new notices coming from HUD and from various federal agencies uh, giving direction and guidance on this. But my understanding is that that's a one-shot deal and that that does not count against you in terms of your ongoing income. Um, by contrast, if you've lost your job and you're applying for unemployment insurance and you're getting uh, perhaps as a result of unemployment insurance and that ex extra $600, uh, you're actually making more uh, than you are on, you know, normally, like let's say you're in, a re in retail or, you know, on, on working at McDonald's and you're at a, you know, relatively uh, low, um, a low uh, dollar an hour uh, wage. It could be that your uh, unemployment benefit could be providing you with a uh, greater income. Um, does that count against you if you're a Section 8 voucher holder? Um, that does. Uh, unemployment insurance is generally considered to be um, taxable income. It's considered, it, it, it counts as income. 
Uh, and so you would actually uh, probably receive a drop in your uh, in your subsidy. One thing I'm not quite clear on is um, you know how whether you have a grace period because your unemployment insurance might just last you know for like a month or two months depending on how long you're you're unemployed and how long this crisis lasts. Um, there are some guidelines around. Um, um, in, in HUD with how soon you have to notify your housing authority. I believe there may be a bit of a grace period. Um, so I'm a little unclear about that. But yeah, if you're experiencing an income increase uh, in these times, which <laughs> more power to you if you are, um, then um, yeah, you would have to get that you'd have to get that adjusted. And it, and it could have repercussions for things like Medicaid. It could have repercussions for um, food stamp benefits um, as well, um, which would be a, obviously somewhat unfortunate, especially in a time of crisis like this. Um, the, the other thing I remember, um, and you kind of got into this a little bit, um, Jess, in terms of, you know, the transparency and going forward and, you know, people are starting to think ahead, uh, especially as we're, you know, we're now a month into this crisis and everybody's been home for a month and we know we're going to be home for another month uh, based on the governor's recent order, um, you know, declaring the emergency, extending the emergency to May, uh, mid-May. Um, people are, uh, with the initial sort of emergency response sort of, I, I, it, I won't say it's over, but it's certainly subsided a little bit from the, the hectic um, aspect of the first couple of weeks when, you know, people were um, moving uh, guests out of homeless shelters and putting them into hotels because they, you know, couldn't, uh, couldn't practice social distancing in a, in a homeless shelter. Um, but that, that sort of scramble, I would say, of the first couple of weeks is, is um, subsided a little bit. Um, and people are starting to think ahead. And how can we use some of these federal dollars that are coming to us and will come to us uh, so that all the folks <clears throat> that are in motels now, and, and the actually most recent figure I heard this morning is we now have 1,500 people that were formerly uh, living in tents, uh, living in homeless shelters, um, and a variety of different types of, of congregate uh, type housing. They're now... Um, safe at home in their own motel rooms and are being supported there with food and um and supported ser whatever supportive services they were receiving in the homeless shelter um whether the domestic violence shelter they're now receiving uh, in a motel uh, what happens on june 15th when um the governor uh, has said that these motels can start taking uh tourist uh reservations after june 15th is everybody going to go back to their tents are they going to go back to the homeless shelter Lord knows we hope not. Um, and this is where we really need to start thinking ahead and figuring out how can we leverage these um, large amounts of federal dollars that we're getting, not just for rental assistance, but really um, to deal with the underlying structural issues here, which is that we don't have enough affordable housing to begin with. I mean, that's part of the reason that we have this problem is we don't have enough affordable housing we don't have enough rental assistance for people who can't pay for market rate housing without some form of economic assistance and for folks with multiple issues that need wraparound services or some kind of supports uh, to succeed in that housing we also need um, sort of what we call the third leg of the affordable housing um, three-legged stool of investments which is supportive services how can we do better uh, and not have people um, go back uh, in, 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 into you know where they came from before they they moved into in, in, into the motels. And clearly, that's we've got to build more housing. Uh, we need more rental assistance. Our National Low Income Housing Coalition just came out with an estimate nationwide. It's going to take a hundred billion dollars worth of rental assistance uh, for everyone who is extremely or very low income that's a uh, cost burden, paying more than 30% of their income for their shelter costs, uh, for them to be able to receive um, <clears throat> Section 8 style uh, rental assistance, uh, which would stabilize them in, in housing. And we also need the capital investments to build more housing because we know that in areas like Chittenden County, where we have a low vacancy rate, even having rental assistance is not necessarily going to do it for you. Uh, and there are other areas of the state like the upper Connecticut River Valley, which is in the same boat, low, low vacancy rate, Brattleboro, low vacancy rate. Um, and it's hard to find housing even with a Section 8 voucher. 
But uh, those are the kinds of things that we need to really start um, looking for uh, and advocating for. We, uh, our, our regional New England Housing Network just came out with a letter that went out this morning to our congressional uh, delegation uh, with a whole array of, um, uh, of, of advocacy priorities uh, for uh, the next federal um, stimulus package that um, can really uh, help to get us out of this mess because as a nation, you know, we, we have a nationwide affordable housing crisis and uh, this public health crisis has, has just really underscored that in just massive ways. Thank you, Erhard. Um, that feels like it. you also covered kind of the big takeaways from uh, Chris's part of the presentation as well. And as we said earlier, we will be sharing um, that, that two page or two page-ish uh, piece that Chris put together that summarizes Champlain Housing Trust's response to the COVID-19 crisis. Well, great. And, uh, and yeah. I, I know uh, I sent you guys some links to, you know, our National Income Housing Coalition documents that shows what their advocacy agenda is at the federal level and, you know, a few other things that um, I think would be good resources for, um, you know, for folks that, um, for your viewers. Did we mention also that um, for folks who want to hear more about the eviction moratorium Friday, this coming Friday, like in three days, uh, four days here, three days, sorry, um, you're going to have another one of these um, Fair Housing Fridays with Vermont Legal Aid and uh, Vermont tenants, right? You're doing my job for me. Why am I even? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to get to that. Sorry, Corinne. No, nope, no, I mean, thank you, Eric, for your reminder. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, um, on Friday, we'll be joined by Legal Aid. So, uh, at the same time as last week, 12.30 to 1.30-ish, we'll try and keep it to 45 minutes, but um, depending on how long that Q&A takes. So that will be a time for uh, people that have more questions about the eviction moratorium and what that looks like. And, um, you know, again, there are a lot of, uh, there is a really strong interest in the, um, rent forgiveness. And so maybe we can have a, a longer dialogue with uh, legal aid and our folks from Vermont tenants will also be in line as well. Um, so definitely come if you're available. Uh, we, we invite all of our audience to jump on that call. And I just want to reiterate again, um, we're just so grateful, Erhard, that you could join us for the second try <laughs> with our technology uh, learning curve here and um also we are you know chris couldn't make it on this second call but um we are grateful that he has been in such close communication with us yeah. um, I, I do see that the little red recording light is on so <laughs> this one will come out good <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does anyone, Jess, do you have anything to add or, or do we feel yeah. like we're good? Yeah, I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erhard, for being here again today. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone this Friday. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate the time and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to get the word out. Okay. Thanks for what you guys are doing. Stay safe. Wash those hands. <laughs> <laughs>